In the dense forests of the southeastern United States, amidst the whispers of ancient trees and the mysteries of the wilderness, lies a tale as old as time itself. It's a story that intertwines the legends of Bigfoots, the elusive giants of the forest, with the rich cultural heritage of the Choctaw Native American Indians. But what if I told you that buried within this folklore is a narrative of conflict and warfare, a clash of civilizations that transcends the boundaries of myth and reality? For centuries, the Choctaw people have inhabited the deep forests of Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and Florida, living in harmony with the land and its creatures. Among these creatures, one figure stands out, the Bigfoot, a towering and elusive being said to roam the wilderness, leaving behind only footprints and whispers in its wake. In the annals of Choctaw tradition, stories abound of encounters with these mysterious beings. Some speak of peaceful coexistence, where Bigfoots were regarded as guardians of the forest, while others tell of tensions and conflicts, where the boundaries between human and creature blurred. But perhaps the most intriguing aspect of this folklore is the notion of a forgotten war, a conflict that pitted the Choctaw people against the Bigfoots in a struggle for dominance over the land. While many dismiss such tales as mere myth and legend, certain discoveries and oral histories suggest otherwise. Let's dive into the Bigfoot-Human War of 1855. Hamas Tubby was an unusually large man, even for a Choctaw Indian. His father, Hanali Tubby stood two inches over eight feet in height and weighed 540 pounds. Hama and his six sons stood about a foot shorter than Palumi, or father Tubby. They were large, exceedingly strong, fierce warriors. Hamas and his sons were the point riders for a troop of Choctaw cavalry known as the Light Horsemen. Many in the Choctaw nation thought it humorous that such large men riding draft horses referred to themselves as light horsemen, Tubby's men experienced something which none would ever forget. This day's assignment was to flush out some bandits that had been preying upon the local farmers. A 30-man troop would be going into an area which later in the state of Oklahoma became the McCurtain County Wilderness Area. These bandits had been not only taking large quantities of corn, squash, and beans, but had as well been taking very young children. This thievery had been taking place across the border in Arkansas as well as in Indian Territory. The captain of the troop of Choctaw Cavalry was a man named Joshua Lafleur. Captain Lafleur was of mixed blood, part French, part Choctaw. The men deeply respected him. Joshua Lafleur was impeccably honest and was brave to a fault. The men had been traveling horseback nonstop since three o'clock in the morning. They began their assignment at the tribal capital in Tuscaloma, and when they finally came to the Clover River, they let their horses eat and the men decided to rest and eat as well. Nonstop riding for eight hours, having to lead their horses across Little River, and the hot July sun were taking a toll on the men and their mounts. When some time had passed, Captain Josh gave the order and the men remounted and they began the last leg of their trip. At or around 4.30 in the afternoon, the troop came to the edge of the area which the bandits were supposed to be inhabiting. Captain Josh signaled with an uplifted hand that the troops should come to a halt. Standing in his stirrups, Captain Josh utilized a ship's eyepiece telescope and promptly turned to his men and gave the command for a full armed charge. The distance between the suspected bandits and the troopers was about 500 yards. The Tubby men and Captain Josh were at the front of the charge, and as the 30 men and he neared the thick, pine forest where the bandits were, two things took place at once. The stench of death assaulted both men and horses, and the horses became uncontrollable. Horses were rearing, pitching and throwing riders. Captain Josh and the seven Tubby men were the only ones in the troop whose mounts were disciplined enough that they continued to obey their riders and continued to charge in the midst of the bandits. When the eight men met with the bandits, they were totally unprepared for what greeted them. The clearing behind the Inital tree cover was actually a large earthen mound. Strewn about the mound were numerous corpses of human children in varying stages of decay. 
Most of the bandits had fled, but three really large, hairy, ape-like creatures remained at the mound. Captain Josh drew his saber and with pistol in hand, saber in the other, charged the huge monsters. The nearest monster killed Captain LaFleur's horse with one blow of its massive hand. The monster never flinched as Captain LaFleur poured bullets from his Patterson's Colt revolver into the beast's chest. After emptying the revolver into the monster, Captain Joshua continued to press the attack with his saber. Many times did the saber meet with the brute's flesh, and many times did blood spew from the gaping wounds on the beast's body. So quickly did this engagement take place that the tubby men had barely enough time to take aim at the derm three monsters before one of the beasts flanked the captain and literally tore off Captain LaFleur's head. There was not time for any sort of delay due to shock. The tubby men opened fire upon the three man beasts. Seven 50 caliber Sharps buffalo rifles impacted the three simian appearing brutes at the same time. From years of routine and practice, all bullets smashed into the three monsters' heads. Six rounds were fired into the heads of the two monsters, which were the culprits that killed their beloved captain. Only the youngest tubby brother, Robert had the presence of mind to put a bullet into the head of the third monster. A legend was born that day. Robert Tubby, 18 years of age, all six feet 11 inches, 373 pounds of him, chased down a wounded man-beast and finished the beast off with only his hunting knife. By the time the other six tubby men caught up with Robert and the monster, Robert had already decapitated the beast. Holding the head aloft with both hands, Robert let out a primal scream which made even the tubby mounts panic. The light horsemen gathered their mounts and surveyed what was before them. Absolute carnage littered about the clearing. The partially consumed bodies of 19 children lay upon and about the mound. The stench of decaying bodies was bad enough, but the overpowering odor of the man-beast's urine and feces was more than the strongest stomach could endure. After retching violently, the men of the troop buried the bodies of the children in 19 small graves, buried their beloved captain, and as a matter of respect, gave him a 21-gun salute. They built a large bonfire, placed the murderous man-beasts upon it, and lit it. As they rode back into Tuscahoma, each man struggled with emotions and thoughts he never before imagined. Let us approach these stories with curiosity, respect, and an open mind. For in the shadows of the forest and the depths of our imagination, there are still secrets waiting to be discovered, truths waiting to be unearthed, and legends waiting to be told. Thank you for joining us on this exploration into the heart of legend and lore. Until we meet again, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more content.